Good morning. Good morning. Warm welcome to you this morning. Literally is a warm welcome this morning, isn't it? It's not often we can actually say that in Wales, but it is very warm uh, today. It's your first time. Lovely to see you. Um, it's especially good as we come to join and worship the eternal God of heaven, the creator of the world. Isn't it amazing that we few people, who are we really? But we can worship the living God who made heaven and earth. And he wants us to worship him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to love him. So a warm welcome as we do that. And we're going to begin our time by seeking his face in prayer. We're going to ask him to come and meet with us this morning and show us himself in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. So let's join in prayer. Everlasting and eternal God, we bow in your wonderful and awesome presence. We know that you are the God from everlasting to everlasting that all things were made by you and for your glory. And we come this morning not to honor or praise ourselves, but to lift up your holy name, to see you, to get a glimpse again of your majesty and your greatness and glory. We pray, O oh God, that you would show us yourself in the face of Jesus Christ, your son. And that as we open up your word, uh, you would show us and shine that light upon us and make us glad in Christ. Lord, if there are those among us who do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, we ask, oh God, that you would speak especially to them, that your spirit might revive and renew their hearts, that they might uh, turn from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved and gave himself for us. And so, Lord, meet with us, we pray, and help us to worship you in spirit and in truth that our lives and our minds might be engaged with what we were about this morning. Help us to tune in, not to switch off, but to engage with the truths of your word and to praise your holy and glorious name. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to stand together and we're going to begin by praising God in the hymn, um, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. It's a, it's a hymn that tells us about how great God is. It tells us how he's shown himself in this creation around us. But more amazingly, as it goes on, it says this awesome God is the one who tenderly cares for us each and every day. And so let's stand together and sing, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. <laughs> Thank 
Well, we're going to look at Daniel uh, chapter 7 uh, this morning. So if you turn in your Bibles to Daniel 7, it'll appear on the screen behind us. We've been looking through this book of Daniel, this Old Testament prophet. It's set in the 6th century BC. Um, Daniel has been living with his, uh, his his nation in Israel, in Jerusalem, and uh, a nation has swept down from the north and captured them, this nation of Babylon. And they're sweeping south to try and capture Egypt, and Israel stands in between them and Egypt. So they capture the Jews from uh, Jerusalem, and they take them back north to, uh, to Babylon. And then um, here is Daniel and his fellow natives, uh, the Jews, and they're stuck in Babylon, and then another empire based in Iraq, which, as we know, it, Iraq, but the Medo-Persian Empire, they come in and they beat uh, Babylon. And so they take captive Babylon and they take captive all their captives as well, including Daniel. And so what has been happening in the first six chapters of Daniel is these two superpowers have beaten uh, Daniel and his friends and Daniel and his friends, his natives, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the other Jews have repeatedly come under immense pressure, immense persecution to give up their faith and to assimilate, to join with the cultures of Babylon and then the Persian culture as well. But they refuse to give in. They see that their God, the God of heaven, is the one who alone is worthy of worshipping and following. But in Daniel 7, he takes a step back in time. He's been captured in Daniel 6 by the Persian Empire, but then Daniel 7, it goes back slightly in time to when he was in Babylon, and the first year of the king Belshazzar, and he gets this vision of the greatness of God and the evil of the nations, and this is where we come to this unusual vision, but a vision nonetheless that speaks in imagery about the greatness of God and the evil of the nation. So let's read Daniel chapter 7 from verse 1 to the end. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, The four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, which is still the imagery of Babylon and uh, Iraq and and, and Assyria. A lion with eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, 
exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. And I'm sure as we've read that, we feel like Daniel. Our countenance changes and we are greatly troubled by these things. It is one of those visions that is like, what does this mean? Well, hopefully as we explore it and as the, the interpretation is given at the end there, we'll begin to understand how God is comforting his own people in exile. 
Well, would the children come to the front? If you want to come to the front, you can stay where you are if you want, of course. But there's some seats in the front here, and you can come down. Morning. 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 Have a look around the stands. Have a look around. What do you think? Better than all the Think the oldest? Maybe not. Not not quite nearly, but maybe the opposite end. You think Josh is Josh behind you? Looks elderly. Ben, wow. Well, Ben, look at look at Ben. Who are, who's the oldest here? Steve, can I ask how old are you? 72. 72. That's not actually that old, is it? Anybody <laughs> must be other people older than 72. Anybody older? Billy, how old can I ask how old you are? 79. 79? Okay. I won't go any further because that's why. <laughs> Just look at you, Andrew. I want to bounce you, don't worry. Okay, 79 years old. How old are you? Two. Five. How old are you? Two. 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 And we read about him in the Bible passage this morning. And he's called here the ancient days. And the ancient of days. Can you all repeat? Ancient of days. Ancient of days. Yes. And that's Daniel, this man from many years ago, who saw a vision of heaven. And he saw God as ancient. What does ancient mean? It means very, 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 very old. Much older than 79, much older than a thousand years old. Yes, yes. God is really, really old and is seated on a throne and Daniel saw that he had white hair. Now, I dyed my white hair in because people respect me more. <laughs> but some people just dyed that too. Some people with gray and white hair means that they are really old. But it also means they know a lot. They know a lot more than us. People with gray hair, because I haven't actually got any at all. I've got any at all. <laughs> um, people who've got gray hair and people who are old, they know a lot more than us. They can think better than us, they are wiser than us, and they've got a lot more experience than us. And that's what Daniel saw about God. God is so old, the Bible says he's from everlasting to everlasting. He never began and he never ends. He never has a birthday. I like the recovery. Could be, could be traffic sick. <laughs> He never began, he never ends. He doesn't even have a birthday because birthdays are for what? Oh. How old are you exactly? Birthday starts, how old we are. And God doesn't have an age because he's back to that. But that means that God knows everything, God understands everything, and God can make the right decisions about everything because he's the ancient of things. Who is he? Ancient of days, and we're going to sing a song in a moment that tells us how God the ancient of days. So, when we think of God, we should think that God is forever, He never began, and He never ends, 
that he knows all things and we can trust him because he understands us, he knows us, he loves us, and he cares for us, he knows what is best for us in our lives. So we are going to sing in a moment, but I'm going to pray and ask God to help you understand that God is ancient and eternal. Praise with God. Thank you that you know all things. Thank you that you know everything about our lives, both past and present and future. You know how long we will live. You know whether we will trust you or not. You know that you have sent your son into this world to save us and to make us your children. We thank you that we can be children of the living, eternal, ancient days. That we can know you and be eternal ourselves as we spend forever in your presence today. So help us to trust you. Help us to know and love you. Help us to know that you are all wise, all knowing, that you know everything about us, and you make the best decisions for our lives. So be with us like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go back to sing. And we're going to sing Ancient of Days. <laughs> Just a couple of notices for uh, this week. Most of the notices will be on the notice board behind before and after the service, but just two 
uh, for your attention. One is that this Wednesday is a members meeting, church members meeting. Um, that's right, isn't it? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Thought I had that right. Yeah, this Wednesday at 7.30 is church members meeting. If you aren't a member, um, uh, please don't come on Wednesday. But if you would like to become a member, do come and see me after the service and we can have a chat about that. Also, advance notice of 1st of July is our family fun day. We'll be here in the church, hopefully on the grounds as well, if the weather's good enough. Uh, if you are able to volunteer, the more that we have, the easier it will be. So do come and see us or sign up on the Church Suite app for that. That would be really helpful. You can go into the app and sign up and we'll know who's available to help. Well, let's come before this Ancient of Days. Let's come and seek his face. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that as we have just sung, that you are worthy of all our praise and all our glory and all our honor because of who you are, the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And we ask this morning that you would engage our hearts to see who he truly is, to worship you from the depths of our hearts, that you would fill our gaze again, O oh God, with yourself and with your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are trustworthy because you are all wise, all knowing, eternal. You have figured out the history of this world, past, present and future, that you hold all things in your hands. There is nothing outside your control. There is no nation that rises up to power without your allowing it. No nation that can become proud and arrogant without you humbling it and destroying it. Nations rise and fall, but you, O oh God, are consistently perfect and holy through it all. You are the one, O oh God, who sits on the throne of the universe, and all things are in your hands. You sustain the world. You love and care for your people intimately and carefully. You know our ways. You know the beginning and end of our lives and all that our lives contain. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would help us to trust you more and more each day, that we would be a people of prayer and of faith, knowing that we know so little, but you know all things. Lord, we acknowledge again that our love for you and our faith in you is often weak, and that we care so little about your ways, and we often go our own ways, and we stray from your paths, thinking that we are wise thinking that we are able to understand and know and make decisions for our own lives. But Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of our unfaithfulness and our self-centered ways, and that you would wash us clean again this morning by the blood of your dear Son, that you would renew our minds, that we might think in more godly and uh, Christ-centered ways, that you would enable us not to be people of this world, but to be people who are constantly looking to the throne of the universe to find strength and help in the day of need. And so with that in mind, oh God, we pray for each one of us uh, this morning in all our various needs and circumstances, known to you and known to so many of us. But Lord, you know and you care. You, you oh God, are the one who knows the very hairs upon our head and each sparrow that falls to the ground, you know and care about it. And so we pray that you would meet us in our point of need and that you would enable us to look to you in all our various circumstances, whether there's pressure or persecution in the workplace, whether we have ill health and concerns about our future. Lord, we thank you that you do care for us and know us, that you love us, and that though you, though you are eternal and sovereign and powerful, you do not forget us or overlook us but that you're intimately involved in every aspect of our lives. So, Lord, we pray that you would grant healing and strength and grace to those who are suffering at this time. We pray that you'd grant unity and love within this church, that we would care for one another and serve one another, and that as we see the day of that final return of Christ approach, that we would do this more and more. Lord, forgive us for ways in which we can be cliquey or selfish. We pray that you would unite our hearts in this church to love one another, and especially those who are in need or are vulnerable, that you would care for them 
and grant us the grace and the strength to love uh, those who are desperately in need of your care and your love. Father, help us to be more prayerful for one another, to think more of each other's needs and to spend time each day uh, before your throne of grace. Find strength to help in time of trouble. Lord, we ask for those who are preaching out this morning, for Dullin and Andrew and others. Lord, would you bless their ministries and may your word be powerful there. Would you save souls and build your kingdom? Lord, we long that you would revive your work today, that many would come to know Christ here in Wales and around this land of ours, that there would be deep repentance in our nation that has strayed so far from your word, that cares so little about the purity and the holiness of our God. We ask that you would grant that the gospel would be powerful today and that the churches would be built and your kingdom spread, that Christ's reign would go from shore to shore and that your name would be spoken of not as a swear word anymore, but that as a name of praise and a name of glory. Lord, would you come down upon us and upon the nations of the world that have forgotten you, that you would meet with power and send out people of courage to tell the news of Christ crucified, that nations that have never heard the gospel, peoples and tongues and tribes that have never heard the name of Christ, that many would even go from this church to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us faithful here in Wales, we pray. Help us to stand for the truth, to love the gospel and to spread the good news of the gospel wherever we are. We pray for those who've gone as missionaries from us. We pray especially for Sean this morning, that you would bless and encourage her and help her to find people around her that will support her in her work there on the ground. And that she would know your, your presence and your strength, even today, as she shares the gospel one-to-one with other ladies. Lord, bless her and encourage her, we ask. And meet with us this morning. May we understand this complex vision of Daniel. May it not be dark to us, but may you enlighten our minds to understand the glorious truths of your word. Help us to understand that this is your word and it is given there for our instruction and for our encouragement. And so, Lord, illuminate our thoughts and minds, we pray, as we look through this passage. And may Jesus be all in all to us at the end. Lord, glorify your name, we pray. May Christ be exalted. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, as we sing our next hymn, the children can go out to crash and to Sunday school. Um, We're going to exalt and praise our sovereign God, the one who reigns, the one who rules in power and majesty. The Lord is king. Lift up your voice.
Well, as you turn back to Daniel chapter 7, just one further announcement that I forgot was uh, tonight we have a visit from Di Hanke. Di Hanke is a pastor in Cardiff. Uh, he works among people who have been rescued from slavery uh, within Cardiff. And he's going to tell us a bit about uh, his work. He's going to tell us about the great redemption that Christ offers and how we can be involved in redeeming others uh, from slavery, uh, even within Cardiff itself. So do come along tonight at six o'clock. It's going to be a good night uh, with Di. So do come and hear him. Well, Daniel chapter seven. And we find Daniel, as I've said, in the middle of a chaotic nation in an overwhelming situation in Babylon. We've gone back a couple of years from Daniel chapter 6. We find Daniel here being lost, feeling uncertain about his life and about his future. But just like, you know, when you go to a huge city, maybe go to London and you're a little bit lost and you're not sure what to do and you're uncertain, maybe fearful even, and you get out your phone and you switch on Google Maps and the big skyscrapers now become little gray squares on your screen. And you tune out to all the hustle and bustle of people and motorbikes and bikes and cars beeping at everything. And it's quite scary, the big city, isn't it? You can tell I haven't lived in London. But, uh, but when you get on Google Maps and you look at the screen, everything seems easy. And you know the direction that you need to go in because you've got a big, thick blue line going around these white little streets and lines leading from where you are to your destination. Well, think about this. God's people do not know where they are. They know they're in Babylon. They know in, they're in captivity, but they lost their sense of purpose as a people, as a Jewish nation. They're, ex they're experiencing terrifying challenges. Some of them are being thrown into fiery furnaces. Others are being thrown into lion's dens. They are being told what to eat, when to eat, what to wear, what their names are. They are losing their identity as a Jewish nation. And so God gives them here a vision, like a Google Maps kind of visual presentation of where they are, who they are, who the nations are that are surrounding them, as evil as they are, and most important of all, who their God is and where he is. Although it seems initially complex, this vision was given by God to simplify things for us, to get this Google map overview of God and the nations. And what this, this vision does, it reveals just how evil all the nations of the world are, and yet how God is still in control behind the scenes. Instead of confusion or fear, this vision is meant to bring confidence and help to Daniel and his fellow exiles, captive as they are in Babylon helping them to navigate the complexities of their lives as they consider the course of their future history and who they are and where they are to go. It's meant to bring them peace, comfort, strength, hope. We, we often do this ourselves, don't we? we? We get caught up in the present, confusing, difficult circumstances of our lives. We fail to see the big picture and so our lives become uncertain, fearful, complex. And at those times, we need to consider the big picture. Who is God? Who is in control? Who is sitting on the throne of the universe? Who can I trust in these circumstances? Daniel's vision restores hope to the people by revealing their place in God's grand design. And their response should be calm, unwavering, dedication to the purposes of the one who sits upon the throne. In the first six chapters, God has been revealing to Daniel 
that he rules, Dan, uh, God rules through local events. But now from Daniel 7 to the end of the book of Daniel, the image is going to change from this is how God rules in a lion's den. This is how God rules in King Belshazzar or King Nebuchadnezzar's throne room. Now it's going to change to how God rules. And he's going to show us through dreams and visions of Daniel that God is still on the throne. What we call apocalyptic language. Apocalyptic is just a fancy way of saying unveiling, revealing. So Daniel 7 to 12 is going to be this apocalyptic, this unveiling through dreams who God is, through images, through pictures. Now, some of you older ones are not going to understand it, but if you are younger and you're into PlayStation sci-fi movie, sci-fi games, or you like sci-fi movies, Daniel 7 to 12 is going to be easy for you. You're going to have to go home and explain this to your parents. What's going on with all these beasts and heads and horns and all this stuff? You're going to have to explain how these images, as unusual and weird and scary as they might be, explain realities in heaven and on earth. What God is going to do is he's going to give a virtual experience, a virtual reality experience of who he is so that we can almost see him, smell him, touch him through these unusual images. Now, Daniel chapter 7 and the vision of this chapter is a parallel vision to what we saw back in Daniel chapter 2. Remember there in Daniel chapter 2, king, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream about a great statue in four parts. And how there was going to be this rolling stone that's going to come down the hill. And a stone not made by human hands. And it was going to destroy this four-parted um, statue. And Daniel was able to tell him by the revelation of God that his kingdom and the next three kingdoms from 600 BC, leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, there were going to be four kingdoms, uh, the, the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, followed by the Roman Empire. Those four empires, four kingdoms, would lead up to this rolling stone kingdom that would destroy them all. And Jesus Christ would be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now, this vision in Daniel 7 is the same vision, but with more detail, more, more clarity, more clarity about who the nations are, what they like, what their nature is, and more clarity upon who God is as he establishes this eternal kingdom of which we are part if we have trusted in Jesus Christ. So we want to notice three things this morning, that this vision is designed to teach us about our God and our world. And the first point here is that this vision reveals the chaotic evils of the nations. The vision reveals the chaotic evil of the nations. We saw in Daniel chapter 2 that from Daniel's time in 600 BC, there would be four kingdoms leading up to Jesus Christ and the kingdom he would eternally establish. These four super nations between Daniel and the arrival of Jesus are now pictured as four beasts arising out of a tumultuous, scary sea. A hundred years before this, the prophet Isaiah had already described the nations like this. In Isaiah 17, 12, saying, Woe to the many nations that rage. They rage like the raging sea. And throughout Scripture, the image of the sea, you think of the storms and the waves and the hurricanes that blow and scare the sailors who are on these mighty, huge waves. The sea represents this kind of this instability of nations, this godlessness, how they rise from chaos and they bring more disorder to the world than they're designed to do. We see this throughout the history of the world. 
nations rise and they, they rise by force. They rise by power. They rise by guns and swords and tanks to destroy other nations. They're not these innocent little parties with some nice politicians trying to do some nice things. Every nation rises to seek to become better than others by pushing others down through evil, through murder. And so throughout scripture, the sea represents this, this godlessness, this, this instability, this, this uncertainty. But the sea also symbolizes a supernatural evil behind it all. Throughout Job and other books, we have this mysterious creature called Leviathan, which was this supernaturally evil creature that lived within the sea. It's all image. There's no actual Leviathan. But it represented all the spiritual opposition of Satan, the evil one, the devil, against the Lord and against his people. And so the sea represents not only disorder and uncertainty, but also supernatural evil from the evil one. And so this vision exposes these four nations, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then the Roman Empire as beasts, evil, ravenous beasts. One, the second one kills off the first one. The third one kills off the second one. The fourth one kills them all and rises up to be the superpower as the Roman Empire did. The first beast is Babylon, represented by this lion with wings, representing the power and the prominence that Babylon had at the time. But then if you notice, the, the wings of this lion are torn off before they are restored to being fully human. We've seen this already in Daniel chapter 2. How king, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he rose up in power. He, you can still see the artifacts from his time, how he represented himself like this as a lion with wings. But he was humbled by God before being restored again. His wings were cut off. But then he was restored again to power. And then the Persian Empire is depicted as a bear, which gorges itself on Babylon. And we see this, we saw this in Daniel 6. Now the king of, of Persia came in and defeated Belshazzar and destroyed the nation of Babylon. Next, says the vision, will come the Greek Empire. Remember, this is 400 years after this vision. Symbolized here by a four-headed leopard, reflecting the swift conquests of Alexander the Great, who was to come. And then the subsequent divisions of Greece under four rulers. And then says Daniel in his vision, he sees this, the fourth empire, Rome, represented as an indescribable beast of horror with iron teeth, signifying its ruthless expansion and domination over the nations. Now, we all agree this is initially, when we look at it, strange. But this vision holds a meaningful representation of the next 600 years of history after, da after Daniel. It's a remarkably accurate portrayal of what will happen over the next half a millennium or so. The nations will be ravenous beasts. Now, think about this. We can pause, just kind of a mental break here. Think about all the nations. What is Wales represented by? Dragon. England, a lion. Russia, a bear. The United States is represented by an eagle. What are they? They're all animals that prey on others. All animals that destroy others. You never have a nation that has a chihuahua flag, do you? Or let's, let's have a, a rep, an image that represents our nation. What should we go for? Let's go for a cockroach. That would be great. No, we don't. We, we, we go for images that say we are stronger than you. Don't mess with us. We are not prey. We are birds of prey, animals of prey. We will destroy you if you come to us. And so all the nations of the world want to be known as beasts. And that's what Daniel is see, seeing in his vision. Lions, 
bears, leopards, animals of prey. And so God is revealing to him the four powerful beastly nations that will emerge before the coming of the Savior of the world in the first century AD, Jesus Christ, and of the immense devastation and destruction that they will bring upon the world. You see, the vision in Daniel 2 was saying there's going to be four nations and they'll be destroyed. But this vision is saying those four nations will be evil, ravenous, and brutal, and murderous. And they will even try eventually to kill off the Lord Jesus Christ, that fourth beast. is evil, more evil than them all, because he'll try and kill the people of God, and he will try and kill Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world himself. What he's seeing is, coming out of the sea, is this satanic force behind all the superpowers of the world. Not just these four, but all superpowers. That they are inherently evil and selfish and proud and corrupt and beastly. Because they're not there to show off the love of Jesus. They're not there to glorify the name of the Lord of heaven. They are there to destroy and kill and to gain power for themselves. It's satanic. It's evil. It's not passive. And so through this use of apocalyptic language, God is unveiling to Daniel the horror of the next few years. Daniel then witnesses, doesn't he, in the fourth beast, the rise of ten horns from the Roman Empire. Ten is the number in Scripture of completeness, symbolizing that Rome will have complete authority and power. They will destroy, they will spread their kingdom right around the world including to Wales and the United Kingdom. And then in verses 8 and 9, three horns stand out for their viciousness, and then one little horn stands out as being even more aggressive than them all. And that's interpreted for us down in verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. Now. Why is this horn, why is this king, as it represents, a standout horn? Well, we know because it's explained in verse 21. As I watched, the horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. Daniel is seeing that from the Roman Empire, one king will focus on wiping out the saints. Now, some understand that to be Nero who in 64 AD organized the mass slaughter of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. We don't know specifically who it is, but we are told three things in Daniel 7 about him. Number one, he will speak arrogant words against the Lord. Number two, he'll viciously persecute the saints. And number three, he will change laws to accomplish his purposes. It seems from this chaotic evil that Satan is going to win the day. The kingdom of God and the people of God and the Savior who comes from God, Jesus Christ, they will all be destroyed. The kingdom, that rolling stone of Daniel 2, that eternal kingdom of heaven, God's reign, it will not succeed because the beasts are vicious and they will destroy everything in their path. And yet, God says, simply not the case. Let me present to you that I am in control, even through all of the horrors of the superpowers of the nations. You notice this at the end of verse 25, we read, Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. You see, it's God saying, I will let my people, my kingdom be persecuted for a while, but I'm still in control. And I will determine exactly when this persecution starts and when it stops. So when you are persecuted, don't think God's out of control. No, God began it. God will finish it and he will keep you safe in it. 
In fact, God's sovereign hand is written all over this chapter. In verse 4, it's God who lifts the lion of Babylon up, makes him stand, gives him the man's heart. God's in control of Babylon. Later, it's God who raises the bear up. It's God who gives the leopard dominion. Daniel would look forward to all these nations and say, it's out of control. It's all a mess. I should fear. I should be terrified. And God says, no, I'll raise them up in the right time and I'll bring them down at the right time. Because I, as we've sung, the ancient of days, he makes the nations rise and he makes the nations fall. While the world seems out of control, God holds all the power. He holds all the power over the superpowers, over the nations, over Wales, and over you and I. He holds all of the power. And this is where we turn from the chaotic evils of the world to see, secondly, the calm rule of the Lord in it all. The calm rule of the Lord. Throughout the history of our world, nations rise and fall like the waves of the sea. They cause devastation and violence and then disappear off the face of the planet. However, above the tumultuous waves, the Lord God sits in calm order, exercising his powerful and gracious rule above it all. Here, Daniel witnesses the placement of thrones and he sees the ancient of days seated. Later, the apostle John in the book of Revelation will pick up on this and he'll see the same vision of God seated on the throne and he'll describe it in the book of Revelation as a tranquil sea of glass. It's a beautiful picture of calm. And a stark contrast to the stormy seas below in our world. A world disturbed by the evils of nations, and yet the Lord isn't disturbed, and the Lord cannot be thwarted. His kingdom will extend far and wide. No evil will prevail against him because he's in charge, just like an architect who can remain calm amid challenges and um, structures not going the way they are supposed to, and people not delivering on time. But the architects factored all of those things into his plans. And so people, did the delivery driver doesn't turn up, he's like, oh, it's fine, I've, we've got this to do instead. Not perturbed. God is not perturbed by the changing superpowers of the world. He's already got it in place. He knows when they'll rise and fall. He knows when his son will come to save the world. He's the eternal ancient of days with white hair of age and wisdom. In other words, he's seen everything before. Nothing surprises him. God's existent ex existence extends far beyond our own understanding of time. We go in by the ticking of the clock. Maybe even now you're going, when is this sermon going to end? This is a long one. <laughs> but God stands above time. He's the ancient of days. He's got vast experience and knowledge. He understands the beginning and the end and everything in between and everything beyond the beginning of time and the end of time. Empires have risen and fallen. Leaders have come and gone. Economies have had ups and downs. And we get fearful in them all, but he remains constant and unaffected. Unaffected. His snowy white garments and hair, they mark him out as untarnished by the evils of the world. A world that is blood-soaked in their scarlet, sinful ways he is righteous he is pure and undefiled so radiantly pure the vision sees that his radiance his purity his holiness it just bursts into fire like that ancient burning bush <clears throat> his throne burns with holiness and justice but is not consumed you notice here that the the, the Thought the, the throne, <clears throat> it has a flaming wheels, revealing that God can take his purity, his holiness, and his wisdom anywhere he desires in his world. He can apply his sovereign purposes throughout the universe. And one day this vision sees 
This pure fire of justice will flow from his throne and it will envelop the world in judgment as the books of justice are opened and even now are as nations collapse under his sovereign control. If you look at verses 11 and 12, they affirm that even the most powerful kings and the arrogant nations of the world that defy God will not prevail against the ancient of days. They speak pridefully, but God responds to them with decisive judgment. Regardless of the nation's or a culture's arrogance or the disdain a country shows towards the living God, God opposes them and will ultimately, they will ultimately face destruction. As I've said, it's easy for us to be consumed with BBC 10 o'clock news, all the confusing things that are happening around the world in France, in Ukraine and Russia and around this world. We say, is God out of control? Does God really have control over all of these situations? When we recognize the unchanging nature of the ancient of days, it helps us to regain this proper perspective on the world. Yes, our world is tumultuous, but God is calm and in control. And even when things seem to crumble around us, God's still on the throne. Even when the world and the nations fight, God's on the throne. Even when my own little life seems to be falling apart, God is still on the throne. The ancient of days is not anxiously on the edge of his seat, biting his nails, going, oh, no, I didn't foresee this event. He's seated, seated calmly and in control. What did the prophet say in Isaiah 26? Lord, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on you because they trust in you. They trust in the Lord forever for you humble those who dwell on high and you lay the lofty city low. The Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet is saying, because God is in control of the nations, those who keep their minds stayed on him can remain in perfect peace. Here is God. He's kind of unpeeling the heavens so that we can get a glimpse through Daniel up into the throne room of the universe. And we can see that lying there at the heart of the throne of the universe is the ancient of days. Like Daniel, we might feel um, isolated, uncertain. When is the next den of lions coming? When is the next fiery furnace going to be opened up? But like him, we can be com comforted as we see that God is in charge. But that's not all, because there is another comfort here too. And in verses 13 to 14, Daniel sees that the kings of our world are not sovereign. Rather, there is a son of man who will be crowned as king of kings. This is what we see thirdly, the coronation of a king. Verse 13. I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, some look at this and mistakenly see it as the second coming of Jesus when he's going to come back in the future. but this is not what it's saying here. The Son of Man is pictured here as ascending through the clouds of heaven to be up in heaven with this Ancient of Days at his throne where he's presented before God and where he receives this eternal glorious kingdom, this universal reign from the Ancient of Days. It's handed over to the Son of Man. And he's 
His kingdom, notice his kingdom doesn't arise from the, the chaotic sea, but it descends from the holy throne of heaven, from the serene and calm control of God. Unlike those beastly kingdoms, it's not characterized by gruesome behavior. This is a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of joy and peace that flows from the wise heart of the glorious ancient of days. Who is this son of man who ascends into heaven to receive this eternal kingdom? Well, over 90 times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us who the son of man is. His name is Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, who declared while on earth that all authority had been given to him on hev- in heaven and on earth by his father. His title, Son of Man, it, it expresses that he became one of us. He took on the likeness of sinful flesh. But the Gospels also identify him as the Son of God because he shares the same nature as God. In other words, what the Gospels present as they see the Son of Man arising to God in heaven, he is of the same nature as God, but he's also the same nature as man. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. Or as we say sometimes, Jesus Christ is both God and man. He is the God-man. And that's pictured here in this vision with its emphasis that he went through the clouds. Remember how God appeared to Israel? He appeared to them in the clouds that covered Mount Sinai. The Psalms depict him as God as riding on the clouds, governing his world. The Son of Man is, is God. But these clouds are water that's arisen from the sea, remarkably, aren't they? Linking him with the fallen nations of the world. He's the same as them and, and yet so different to them and so above them. So the vision is saying that this Son of Man is he's linked to heaven and he's truly God, but he's also linked to earth and he's truly man, the Son of God and the Son of Man. The vision is conf- conveying that the nations, they cannot find hope within themselves, within the stormy seas of the nations, because they're inherently evil. Instead, the hope for the nations must come from a heavenly source that is also authentically human. I hope I haven't lost you all there, but this is what Psalm 8 was saying. When Psalm 8 looked forward to the coming of Christ, it said, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. The great hope of the Old Testament was that one would descend to earth, become a true human being to save and rescue and forgive the evil nations of the world, the fallen peoples of the world, the sinners, you and I, that the Son of Man would come and identify himself with us. But that he'd also, after his death and his burial, that he would ascend back through the clouds into heaven where he would be crowned king of kings and lord of lords, and he would establish his eternal reign upon earth. This is what has already happened 2,000 years ago. We remember it at Christmas. We remember it at Easter. We remember it on Ascension Sunday. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and was born as a human being. He lived that perfect and holy life of the ancient of days, unstained and spotted by the evils of the nations. He died upon the cross, taking the evils of the nations upon himself and all the justice we deserved upon himself, killing it on the cross, burying it in the ground, and then rising victoriously as the Son of Man, ascending into heaven where he has been crowned and is now seated at the right hand of his Father as the Lord of Lords. That victory 
of Christ has brought great hope, not only to Daniel, but to all those who've suffered under the reigns of the evil nations of the world. Think of Stephen being martyred in the book of Acts. He looked up, he says, I saw heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Think of the apostle John exiled to Patmos. There he is on his own. No other believers around, sitting on his own. He gets this vision, Revelation of one, the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in response, he writes this book of Revelation as a comfort to Christians going through persecution in all eras. This hope that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the ancient of days brings peace, comfort, control. Yes, the nations are tumultuous, but Jesus has won. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is seated along with his father. Daniel is initially troubled by the terrifying vision, but he too would find great comfort as he walked through extreme danger. Because as we close, notice verse 27. What does he realize? As he sees this vision of the Son of Man in the Ancient of Days, he realizes that the victory of the Son of Man is his victory too in Christ. Verse 27, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heavens shall be given to the saints of the Most High. He sees Christ installed on Mount Zion. The Son of Man has become the King. And he says, we've become kings in him. Our safety, our security is found in Jesus Christ alone. Preaching on this, Spurgeon, an old preacher, said it well. As surely as Christ overcame and triumphed once for you, so surely you that love his name shall triumph in him too. A vision that begins like a frightening nightmare with monsters emerging from the sea concludes joyfully and optimistically as Christ ascends to heaven where God crowns him as the ruler of the world and says, come, put your trust in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you will not be troubled so much by the nations of the world or the evils even of your own lives but you will rest in the one who controls the world and in whose kingdom you find yourself today. Yes, we must never be naive, but we can trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow in your glorious presence. We confess that we are so often troubled by our immediate circumstances by world situations. We can even be troubled by passages like this with um, scary and unusual imagery. But Lord, help us to see you, the Lord of heaven, behind it all. Help us to rest in your goodness and grace and to know that you are building a kingdom where Jesus shall reign eternally and where one day we shall be raised through the clouds to be with him, where we will be seated in calm and orderly fashion, praising his name. And nothing will trouble us anymore. No sin, no fear, no death, no destruction or despair, but we will rest in your goodness and grace. Until that day, O Lord, keep us looking to Christ. Keep us calm and resting upon your sovereign purposes in our world. And may Christ be honored in our lives and in our various situations. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, we're going to close with a hymn. The hymn is one that we've learned recently, but it gives glory. It praises. It says, all hail to this king who is seated in heaven. So let's stand and worship the Lord Jesus in this way. Thank you.
Thank you. 